Okay, so we're just going to talk through some of the project phases that uh, I think all of us go through and some of the stress and strains that we often see and hopefully propose a slightly better way that we could be doing uh, some of the projects that we're involved in. So let's just run through what happens in a typical project. So on the x-axis here, we go from start to finish and we have the elapsed time. And then on the left-hand side here on the y-axis, we have chaos to structure. So from when we first start a project, or we've just won the brief, up to when we have a client deliverable that explains to them and gets to the bottom of their problem. So in a typical project, what we might see here is we've won the brief and immediately afterwards we might have a few deliverables to get us going. So there might be a slight uptick here. And then once those are done, we start off with the client and we start at the beginning. Well, it's summer and Wimbledon's on and you might want to watch a bit of the tennis. And you want to be outside, you don't really want to be inside. So everything kind of dips off a little bit um, because there's not this urgency when you know you've got a two or three month timeline ahead of you to get the work done. You might get to about the middle stage here and there might be a deliverable where the client wants to see what you're up to, in which case there's a bit of a, dip, a, bit of a rise there. And then you know you're at about August time, you want to go on holiday and everything kind of dips off again. And then all of a sudden, about a month before, if you're anything like me, you suddenly go, wow, I've got a lot to do here. And there's this huge, great big crescendo that leads you up to the client deliverable here. So if we just look, we have the client deliverables here, here, and here, which is the upticks. And in between that, we're kind of flatlining and, and dipping off and not really keeping a pace with the project. Now, I just want to go through a slightly different way of doing this because the structure doesn't really come to this project until we hit here, where we start to really get stressed and focused and start to work out what we need to be looking at. So let's think about a different way of doing this. So let's say we've won the project again, we're at the same point in time. But instead of just doing the deliverables here and, and, and giving the next step, how about if we do some kind of problem framing exercise where everybody sits in a room or you sit independently at your desk and think about all the issues that might run into or feed into what you're going to try and deliver at the end here when you get this structure. So you have this huge tick up here where you're discussing with colleagues, you're trying to collate, collect as much information as possible and try and make sense of it. And I'll give you some ideas of how we can actually make sense of those and some, a technique to do that later on. But then if we think about the practicalities of it, if we were to do this kind of exercise, then here, when we're delivering to the client, we can say to them, we've gone away and we've thought about all these different things. These are the materials we've got and this is why we've included them. Because at the end, we want to talk to you about this, this, and this, and have a very clear sense of structure. So the client immediately is very impressed. You've, you've already done an awful lot of thinking, and you've really tailored your, your, your thinking and any outputs you have for them around what the end goal is going to be. But not only that, but it actually gives you a chance then to make sure that you're on course with the client, that you're delivering what they want in the end. And also, they might have some other ideas for you that you don't know about that you haven't come across in your research, but you're able to have a sensible and really very intelligent conversation with them at this point in time. If that's done, then you still have this tailing off project uh, piece here because of the project's not due for some time. But all of your thinking and all of this work you're doing in this section is very focused around a set number of topics which you've introduced here. So I would anticipate something closer to this. And then you're still going to have a percent of project work. You always will but hopefully you won't be burning a midnight oil quite so much with this kind of technique. So the key to this is here, and this problem framing bit looks like an unhappy face, but actually uh, it really does save so much time and effort in the long run. So I'm just going to talk to you now about one kind of qualitative technique that we might want to use, which is known as a DuPont. Okay, so what we're going to go through here is we're going to go through a Minto model, which is a qualitative way of looking or framing a problem and trying to get down to all of the, the layers that we need to look at to get to an end product to answer the question for our client. So here we're going to look at should client X launch a new chronic heart failure product. Now immediately when we're thinking about this, we firstly need to know is it actually an attractive market to go into? So is the market big, is it growing, and is the cost of treatment growing in line with the pace of change? So immediately we have three things that we can be looking at here um, to work out, engage the attractiveness. If that's the case and we say 
yeah, you know, our initial look says that there might be something here. We then go to the next level. Is it possible for client X to actually make strides and get into this market? So what might we want to look at here? Well, we already know that it's attractive. So surely other competitors might have also tried to move in as well. If so, what have they done? And how have they done it successfully? We then might want to look at we then might want to look at any unmet needs that might be left for us to try and get into. So presumably, because it is an attractive market, we have other competitors that are playing in that space. Depending on whether they've been successful or not, and whether they've left any space for anybody else, then we, we kind of have our next layer, so we know it's attractive, and we know that it's possible for a client X to actually go into that space. But finally, the last thing that we need to look at in this example is what client X would then need to do to actually take a share of the market. So what do they need to do to be able to deliver? Well, do they have the right infrastructure in place at the moment? Is this something that could be easily achieved, or do they have to do, make wholesale changes to their business model? Does it tie into the value proposition that they currently have? If client X is currently in oncology, and this is in cardiovascular, does it even make sense for them to move into this space? I know they're interested in it, but do the infrastructure changes they have to make and the messaging they have to put out to clients actually tie in? Does it make sense? Um, and then finally, tied in with both of these, is what are the risks? If it's a small company, if client X is a small company, perhaps actually they're better off staying into the niche market they're currently in rather than trying to move into something as big um, as chronic heart failure. So immediately what we have here is we have the attractiveness of the market, whether it's possible for the client X to actually move into it, and then what they need to have been able to deliver. And immediately by laying it out in this visual way, you can start to see and draw linkages. So tied in with whether it's big and it's growing, does the cost of treatment tie to that? Now, that also ties in here with the value proposition, ties into what other competitors are doing, and the pricing that they've done these products and it ties into whether or not that's been successful from a market access and a payer's point of view. If we look at the unmet needs here, well, if other competitors are doing it and they've been success, then what else is there left for us to do? How might we actually be able to play in it? And then what risks might be associated with trying to meet those unmet needs in a very niche and busy marketplace? By doing this kind of exercise, which is, is very quick and very simple to do, we're able to immediately lay out these nine different areas that we need to be looking into and then tie them together and able to come up with a final message for our clients.